Hey everyone, welcome back to our last lecture of the semester and to day two of topic 21. So today what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up topic 21 and we're going to do that by working through our case study. So as a reminder, the case study that we are working on deals with two siblings and one sibling, Liam, is affected with muscular dystrophy, whereas Elijah is unaffected. And so our goal for this case study is to use the information that is provided, and we're going to use our knowledge of DNA replication and the central dogma and mutations, and we're going to explore how is it possible that Liam has muscular dystrophy, but Elijah does not at the molecular level. So before we get into sequencing and looking at the X chromosomes for Elijah and for Liam, let's first talk about what is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So there are many different types of muscular dystrophy, and out of the many types that there are, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is one of the worser forms. It's definitely more severe, and as you all have probably heard of with respect to muscular dystrophy, it is a progressive degenerative muscle disease. In terms of the statistics and the numbers that we see, we typically see about one in 3,000 to 5,000 births. And this is with respect to males. And for muscular dystrophy, there are actually a lot of many different mutations that are possible, and we'll get into that here in a second. But let's take a look at some of the figures that are here on this page. So on the left, we have an image showing us a normal bicep versus the bicep of a patient that has muscular dystrophy. And so we can see that there appears to be a change here in the biceps. So in terms of the length, it's definitely um, elongated here and it's not as large. And so one of the things that we see because of muscular dystrophy is the breakdown of um, muscles essentially over time. And so what does that mean? That translates to, if we take a look at the percentages of males with um, age increasing and how many of them are using a wheelchair. So on the x-axis here we have years and on the y-axis we have percentage. So for patients that have muscular dystrophy, by the time most of them reach adulthood, about 90% of them are found have to use a wheelchair. And so let's take a closer look at the molecular mechanism of this. So if you recall, earlier in the semester, we talked about the cytoskeleton, we talked about how muscles contract, and muscular dystrophy deals very closely with that. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do is draw a cell here. Here's our nucleus. Now recall that when we think about the cytoskeleton, we talk about actin kind of being all throughout the cell. And we know that actin is really important for movement of the cell. If we think back to muscles, we have actin and myosin, and that is what is causing the muscle to contract. And um, so you can start to imagine that, well, if we're having problems with muscles, that's going to lead into the cytoskeleton. So of course, we have other components of the cytoskeleton, but I'm focusing on actin, and the reason that I'm focusing here on actin is because when we have the actin throughout the cell, we actually have a protein, and I'm going to draw it here as just lines and circles, and this protein is called dystrophin, and what dystrophin does is it anchors that actin to the plasma membrane of the cell. If that actin is not anchored, you can imagine that, well, when we move a cell forward, that we're not going to be able to have that lamellipodium stick out as well because the actin will be moving, but it's not connected to the plasma membrane, so it's unable to push that plasma membrane forward. So this is really important for the integrity of the cell itself. And then of course, those cells make up the muscle. And so you can kind of start to see how the pieces come together. Well, it turns out if we move forward thinking about muscular dystrophy, muscular dystrophy is an X-linked recessive disease. 
And that is why the statistic that I gave you in terms of how many births do we see where patients have muscular dystrophy was with respect to males because of hers, males have um, one X chromosome, whereas females will have two X chromosomes. And so as you can imagine, we see a, as with many other X-linked diseases, we see a higher proportion of biological males that are affected by these X-linked diseases. And so here's just an image on the right reminding us of the X and Y chromosomes that are found in biological males and females. And this red that is highlighted here, that is the dystrophin gene. So if we move a little forward and we zoom in on that X chromosome and we look at the dystrophin gene, which is the one that codes for the dystrophin protein, we've already talked about in this class that it's really big. So it's about 2.4 million base pairs. And we just recently talked about transcription and translation. So this statistic blows my mind, but because of how large this gene is, it takes 16 hours to transcribe. So that is 16 hours of RNA polymerase, reading the template DNA and synthesizing RNA, which is absolutely amazing. And we know that this is a gene that is highly spliced. So when we talked about transcription and then we talked about processing of RNA, we said one of the things that eukaryotes do is splicing and we actually use the dystrophin gene as an example. So with how large this gene is, people can actually map mutations. And so we have been able to determine where mutations can be found in this gene that can lead to the different forms of muscular dystrophy. And it turns out that there there are hundreds of mutations that are possible that can result in muscular dystrophy. Some are more detrimental than others, but again, we can map what those are. So our question now, kind of circling back to the point of this case study, is why does Liam have muscular dystrophy but Elijah does not? So what we did was we started with their X chromosome. So both Liam and Elijah are biological males. So they have an X and a Y chromosome. And knowing that the dystrophin gene is X-linked, we went ahead and sequenced both of their X chromosomes. So what we have is the results of that sequencing. And what the sequencing told us was that there are five different nucleotide differences between Elijah and Liam in the dystrophin gene. So let's take a look at these differences um, in a little bit more detail. So here is Elijah's X chromosome. Here is Liam's X chromosome. And so we can see Elijah has an A, Liam has a G. Here we have a T and an A, a C and a T a C and a T, a T and a G. So those are the five differences and let's take a closer look at them. So here's just another way of looking at the X chromosome and in particular at that gene structure. And when we look at those five mutations, we see that one of them is in the promoter and three of them, so difference two, three and five are in exons, and difference number four is in an intron. So we're actually going to start with difference number four. And the reason that we're going to start with difference number four is there is a mutation and it's in the intron. So whenever we think of introns and exons, we need to think about splicing. So when it comes to splicing, we know from earlier conversations that introns are cut out and exons are expressed. So we can actually use what we know about gene structure and right away cross one of these differences out as being the likely reason that Liam has muscular dystrophy and Elijah does not. And since we know that introns are cut out, in the final mRNA, that intron, so difference number four, would not be present. So we can actually go ahead and cross that off. So that leads us with, leaves us with differences one, two, three, 
or five being the possible reasons for why Liam has muscular dystrophy. So let's go ahead now and we're going to start with the blank page. So here we have difference number four crossed out and we're going to go ahead and take a look at difference number two. So for difference number two, we went ahead and right here where our DNA is, I went ahead and gave you what that codon is for Elisha and what the codon is for Liam. So looking at this in both Elijah and Liam, even though the codon is different, both of those codons code for serine. So what kind of a mutation would this be? And hopefully you're yelling at the screen and hopefully you're telling me that this is a silent mutation. So even though we have a mutation at the DNA level where instead of a T, like we have in Elijah, we have an A present in Liam. Even though there is that mutation in the DNA, which of course when we look at the RNA, we see a different base as well, the codon encodes for the same amino acid. Therefore, this is a silent mutation. So because of this, we can go ahead and cross off difference number two as well. So let's go ahead now and move forward. And we're going to focus on difference number five now. So I went ahead and did the same thing. And for difference number five here, we figured out what the reading frame was. And here is the codon. So we have GAU. This codon encodes for aspartic acid. In Liam's X chromosome, we have GAG, which codes for glutamic acid. So at this position, Elijah has aspartic acid in his dystrophin protein, whereas Liam has glutamic acid. So the question becomes, well, could this possibly cause muscular dystrophy in Liam versus Elijah? And the answer is yes, right? Those are different. That is not a silent mutation. Um, we can actually go ahead and label this as a missense mutation because we have a change in an amino acid. So let's take a closer look though at the chemistry of aspartic acid and glutamic acid. So they're both acidic and if you recall back to the very first unit of the semester, we actually talked all about the amino acid side chains and if we take a look at the structures of them, this could help us out in our case study. So here we have aspartic acid on the left. So we have a C double bond O, a CO minus, and a CH2 for our group. Well, if we take a look at glutamic acid, this bottom half is identical to aspartic acid. It is just a teeny bit longer because it has an extra CH2 group there. So in terms of chemistry, if we look at aspartic acid and glutamic acid, I would say that these R groups are very, very similar. And so it turns out that structurally, and because the structures are similar and we look at what atoms are there, we can actually hypothesize that biochemically, they are also very similar. So while this may be a possibility as to why one brother has muscular dystrophy but the other does not, it's probably not very likely based on what we know about chemistry. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to put a question mark over difference number five for now. And we're going to look at the other ones and then see, is it possible that that is the case or are there other ones that would be more likely the causative agent behind Liam having muscular dystrophy. So now let's go ahead and look at difference number one. So difference number one is in the promoter. And if you recall back to when we talked about transcription, the promoter is where we start transcription. So RNA polymerase and other proteins have to recognize it to open up the DNA so that we can start transcription. So if our hypothesis is that difference number one, so that mutation in the promoter, is 
the reason why Liam has muscular dystrophy, but Elijah does not, what would you predict would be the mRNA levels of dystrophin in the muscle? So go ahead and pause the video and think about what you think would occur if this was the difference that caused muscular dystrophy. All right, so hopefully you've taken some time and hopefully you've walked through this problem. And we're going to go through this question. And this is one that many students um, struggle with. And the reason for this is many of you probably said that the answer is C, that you would think that it would be lower than. So that if muscular dystrophy is caused because we have a mutation in the dystrophin gene, then maybe we don't have any dystrophin protein, and so our mRNA would be lower, right? That's what most students say. But it turns out that it could also be higher. So mutations can cause an increase or a decrease. So you can imagine that maybe the mutation in the promoter makes RNA polymerase even more attracted to that promoter, which means that it's going to make more of that mRNA. And so we can cross off A the same as the promoter's different. There's potentially likely changes there, but we don't know if it's higher or if it's lower because, again, we don't know if that change in promoter makes the RNA polymerase like the promoter more. Therefore, it's going to come and transcribe the gene more, which means we'll get more mRNA levels. Or does it like that promoter less, and so it's not going to transcribe that gene as much, which means we'll get a lower level. So we would predict that it is different in some way. So we went ahead and we got into the lab and we took a sample of Elijah's and Liam's muscle. We extracted the RNA and we looked specifically at the dystrophin levels and this is what we saw. So we saw in both Elijah and in Liam that the dystrophin mRNA levels were exactly the same. So now that we know that they're exactly the same, how would you, well, how would you interpret these results or what would you conclude from these results? So what I would conclude is because the mRNA levels are the same, it means that even though we had a mutation in this promoter, it likely is not causing any problems with transcription because we see the same levels of mRNA which come from transcription. Therefore, I would say that this difference is not the cause of muscular dystrophy in Liam. So we can go ahead and cross off difference number one. So, so far we've crossed off difference one, difference two, difference four, and we've said probably not difference five, but maybe. So let's go ahead and now investigate the last difference, and that is difference number three. So again, for difference number three, we went ahead and we looked at the reading frame around those differences, and we found and we found the reading frame and we were able to determine what the mRNA and what the codons would be. So for Elijah, our codon is CAA, which encodes for GLU or glutamic acid. Now in Liam, we have UAA, which is a stop codon. So this difference, if we were to hypo if we were to think about what type of mutation this is, we have a change in an amino acid and that change in amino acid specifically changes to a stop codon. So this is a nonsense mutation. So let's do some application and practice problems of this specific difference in this mutation. So when DNA polymerase reaches the nucleotides that encode for the premature stop codon, what do you think will happen? A, it will stop when it reaches the first nucleotide encoding for the premature stop codon. B, it'll stop when it reaches the last nucleotide encoding from the premature stop codon. Or C, it will not be affected by the space change and will continue to read through the mutation. So hopefully you recall from 
our conversations about stops and starts when we talked about translation. These start and stop codons only affect the ribosomes. They do not affect replication and they do not affect transcription. So DNA polymerase is going to not be affected by this base change. So this is a greater image of even more of the genome. And so this is a bunch of genes. And so this is a big piece of the genome. And the red boxes that you see are any triplet nucleotides that are found along a DNA strand that encode for stop codons. So if we think about this for a second, if DNA polymerase, which is the polymerase that copies DNA by reading DNA, would stop every time it recognized a triplet that encodes for a stop codon, we would have replication that would stop every single time. And that would mean we could never replicate our entire genome. And so the key here is that DNA polymerase is not affected by DNA changes. And so what that means is that replication would be completely normal. So, all right, let's do another question here. So we've covered replication. Let's talk about transcription. So we're still talking about difference number three here, so that premature stop codon. And we're doing the same thing again. So we are now looking at the size of mRNA. So um, in transcription, what will the size of the mRNA be for the dystrophin gene found in Elijah versus Liam? So here we have Elijah's size. It's a little less than 20,000 bases there. So what do you predict will be the effect of the premature stop codon on mRNA size. Do you think it will result in a shorter mRNA in Liam, a longer mRNA, or the same size mRNA in both Liam and Elijah? So if you're struggling to answer this question, let me pose a follow-up question for you and see if this helps. So we'll come back to this question in a second here. All right, so here we have the two strands of DNA, and this is Liam's DNA. So here on the bottom, we have the template strain. So three prime to five prime. Here on the top, we have the coding. So five prime to three prime. Here is that stop codon that is encoded for. So this red box here indicates where the RNA polymerase is. And so if we have an RNA polymerase that is starting here at the three prime end, and it is reading G-A-T, A-C-A, C-G-A, A-T-T. So it finally gets here to the stop codon. What do you think is going to happen when RNA polymerase reaches that? Is it going to stop or will it continue? So let's think back to transcription for a second. So for RNA polymerase, it needs a couple things, right? On the DNA, it needs a promoter. And then, of course, we have our gene. And then the very last thing that we have is a terminator sequence. But nowhere in that DNA, when we talked about transcription, did we talk about a stop codon being important for RNA polymerase. Because, again, stop codons are only affecting ribosomes. So from this we can actually conclude that, nope, RNA polymerase is not going to stop when it reaches the first nucleotide that encodes for the premature stop codon. It's not going to stop when it reaches the, na the last nucleotide. It's going to be unaffected, and it's going to continue to read through the change in that DNA. And it's going to continue until it reaches the termination sequence that is found in the DNA for that gene. So the key here is that RNA polymerase is not affected by this DNA change. RNA transcription will occur normally. So now if we go back for a second to this question, and what do we think will the mRNA dystrophin size look like for Liam? We know that transcription will not be affected. Therefore, we would hypothesize that we should have the same mRNA in both Liam 
and in Elijah. And in fact, it turns out when we do the experiment, that is what we see. So here we have Elijah and Liam. Here on the y-axis, we have that mRNA size. In both of these mRNAs, that encode for the dystrophin gene are the same size. So this matches up perfectly with our prediction since we hypothesized that because transcription is unaffected by premature stop codons that we should see the same mRNA size. All right, so moving forward now, you can probably guess what I'm going to ask you next, and that is, what do you predict will be the effect of the premature stop codon on protein size? So here on the x-axis, we've got Elijah and Liam again. On the y, we have the protein size. So here's Elijah's protein size. It's probably about 400 kilodaltons based on how we've drawn our graph here. So our question now becomes, well, based on what we know about the stop codon, what effect will this premature stop codon have on protein size? Do you think it will result in a smaller dystrophin protein, a larger dystrophin protein, or the same size? So hopefully you are following along with me and we can cross off C. So we know we're not going to have the same size because we have a premature stop codon and we know that the ribosome does recognize triplet codons. And so our hypothesis is that this is going to result in a smaller dystrophin protein. And the reason for that is we have a premature stop codon. So the stop codon is way earlier than it should be. And it turns out when we do the experiment, that is exactly what we see. So we see a dystrophin protein right here for Liam that is much smaller than that of Elijah's. And again, this ties back to where that stop codon is. So we've got a couple of questions. So two questions that we're going to do here as a final wrap up. And what I want you all to do is in the comments below is if you have questions or you have comments or any of the ways that I have explained how I've wa walked through this are a little different than how you walked through it, please put it in the comments below. I want to make sure that our class has a discussion about this. So we've got two questions that we're going to do now. So here's just another image. Again, these are the five differences. And for these five nucleotide differences that we have, which of them are mutations? So A, all five are mutations, B, the ones in exons, C, the ones in exons that change amino acids, or D, the one that causes muscular dystrophy. So hopefully you all have circled A. All five are mutations. So remember that not all mutations are negative changes. Not every single genotypic change results in a phenotypic change. So for example, here of Hurst difference number two, we classify this as a silent mutation. Even though the amino acid does not change, it is still a mutation at the DNA level, but that one is not the causative agent of muscular dystrophy. Here in exon 53 or difference number 5, we of course have a missense mutation, so the change in amino acid. This mutation in the intron, although it is a mutation because introns are cut out, just doesn't happen to play a role and doesn't have any phenotypic changes. And in the promoter, even though there is a mutation, again, it has no effect on transcription. And of course, here in exon 52 or difference number three, we have that nonsense mutation. So taking all of this together, if we were to summarize this, so if we were to conclude from this activity, the causative agent, so this is the last question, if you will, and the last question of hers is, from all of the data, what are your conclusions? What do you think is the most probable difference that is the causative reason of why Liam has muscular dystrophy and Elijah does not? 
And so let me know in the comments below if your conclusion matches up with mine. And my conclusion is that the premature stop codon is the likely reason why Liam has muscular dystrophy, but Elijah does not. So while it is possible still that difference number five, so right here where we have that missense mutation, could have been the reason for it, but this mutation is past the stop codon. So this mutation, this missense mutation that we have here is never going to actually make it to the ribosome in Liam. Therefore, based on all of the data that we have, the most likely reason as to why Liam has muscular dystrophy is because of this premature stop codon right here. So let me know in the comments below if you liked this case study. It's a little different than what we typically do, but I wanted something that was a nice application of the material that we've been talking about in class. And congratulations, you have survived your not only your last lecture for this class, but also your last online lecture. It definitely feels weird to be saying that because this is actually the last lecture that I'm filming for both of the classes that I teach. So it's kind of weird knowing that it's my last lecture to record as well. And if you're still hanging with me here till the very end, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for a really great semester. And I'm sorry that our semester is not what we thought it would be when we first began the year and that the world has kind of turned upside down and life is not anything like that of what we know. But um, I still want to thank you. It has still been a really fun semester for me. I have learned a lot and I've enjoyed getting to know each and every single one of you. And please do not hesitate to reach out whether it's the remainder of this semester or at any point past the semester if you need anything. So that is it. This is Hubs checking out for the rest of the semester and I will catch you all on the flip side. Stay safe everyone. Bye.